but this is a wind tunnel. Um, and so if you want to minimize, if you want to maximize lift and minimize drag on a plane, then you design it for that. And uh, now probably you do it uh, numerically, but um, there are some aspects of that that perhaps aren't amenable to numerical modeling that you might want to examine in a, a wind tunnel. And so the idea is that you want to have your either model or your scaled prototype, one-to-one -one scaled prototype in this particular case, with all the bells and whistles of what's going on. So the wheels are turning, so there's additional currents that you could imagine that would result from that. And you have it doing whatever it would do on the road. And you try and measure the force that gets applied against it as it's being, as has this wind pushed against it. So the car is static, the wind is moving past it, and you measure the forces. And if you want to do that, you can measure the drag coverage. You'd want to design it, I guess, both so you have a, a low drag coefficient and you probably have a, a large negative lift coefficient pushing it down uh, onto the rope so to, to be able to keep it in place. And what's the last one? Oh, the last one's the soccer ball. And so I don't know how many people might have chosen to do why a baseball curves or why um, a f you spin a football when you throw a football for their project, uh, but we'll talk about it when we deal with external flows. It's basically that the, the spin of the ball changes objects. the flow pattern around it and changes NASA the drag. NASA is not so in the business of drag designing the soccer other. balls or any balls for that matter. We're all testing them. Exactly the what same we do use would be with sports uh, balls any other here, object uh, flying through the air. Lab. And so, and so this is a little segment found that the guys talking about young kids interest. And turn off. Talking about the soccer balls for Brazil in 2014. I think they got some flack over the ones in uh, 2010 in South Africa that they weren't particularly stable. They would, he called it in this thumbing or something. I think he called it uh, that instead of going in a straight line, uh, it would actually jiggle as it goes through the air. And it's the same idea. You can look at the flow regime by using these uh, smoke jets. Uh, we looked at this kind of Schlieren picture last time of a cylinder with flow around it and the the von Karman uh, vortex street tailing off the back of it, the certain Reynolds number. And so the same occurs here. So almost all the flows that we'll talk about as external flows, if they're in air, they're almost always turbulent, uh, which is actually quite useful to us because the coefficient of drag, instead of being a function of Reynolds number, is actually a constant. It makes the calculations much, much easier. And so this is just... Uh, no, surprising the things that you might want to uh, look at in a, uh, you know, in a wind tunnel. And uh, so people riding bikes, people running in wind tunnels to be able to look at what poses you might have, people sitting on skis and crouched positions for downhill for the Super G to figure out how to reduce your, uh, um, your drag coefficient as much as possible. Because skiing, like anything else, you know, you have gravity going downwards. That's what the force is, the motive force is pulling you downwards. Acting against you is friction on the skis, not very much, and also drag on the air that you're going past. And so those are the, uh, the, the kinds of things that we might like to deal with and doing um, experiments with, um, with uh, either scaled models or with full-scale models is, is one way to do it. And to avoid doing a zillion individual experiments and so this is actually from a previous component so if, if you imagine looking at flow in a pipe and you want to get the, the flow equation for flow in a pipe what you could do is you could take a pipe and you could force flow to occur in that pipe and you could measure for instance for a given geometry of the pipe a given diameter, a given fluid of given density, water, density and viscosity known. You put a pressure gradient across it from the upstream to the downstream, and we'll talk about this. And as a result of that pressure gradient, you get some flow velocity coming out of it. So you could imagine having a pressure gradient applied, you get a flow velocity. You plot a point. You increase the pressure gradient, you get a different velocity, you get a second point. 
And you keep on repeating that for a variety of these different components. Then you have some curve that results from that. If you then used a pipe which instead of being this diameter was maybe a smaller pipe, then I suppose if you then used the same pressure as before, you might have a smaller velocity. You'd expect a smaller velocity because there's more drag. And you could repeat the process for doing this for the smaller pipe for the same conditions you had before. So now you have a pipe that's um, two centimeters in diameter. You have one that's one centimeter in diameter. You have it for just one fluid, which is water. You could do the experiment now with a different viscosity. So you could imagine that from doing these experiments, you'd have a huge number of graphs like this, and you'd like to get one single relationship out of it. And so the way to do that is to use dimensional analysis, which is what we're talking about now, is so that you don't have all of these different graphs from doing different things. So this is providing a pressure gradient uh, and changing the diameter for constant velocities that you apply, constant viscosities and densities. You'd end up with a relationship like this. So it's a method to be able to amalgamate these in some way. And what we're going to find out is that there is a way to do it, and it allows you to figure out that the friction factor, which is basically um, the Euler number, is related to Reynolds number, like this, for laminar flow. And we've talked about laminar flow and we haven't really talked about turbulent flow. But for a Reynolds number of 2,000 is where it transits from being laminar to being turbulent. And so you, you don't have to necessarily get this figured down now. You'll see it many times in the next few weeks uh, because it relates both to pipe flow. It relates to the forces that you have on a baseball as it's going through the air, the drag or a plane or lift in a plane. And what dimensional analysis allows us to do is basically to be able to figure out exactly what this relationship, this equation is. This line has an equation. Um, I won't say what the equation is but uh, because I'll just confuse matters. But the idea is to be able to get these relationships just by doing experiments. So that may seem a little far-fetched. So that's kind of the, the preamble, if you like, to what we, we might try today. We talked last time about there are three main properties that we talked about. I misspoke last time. I said that uh, uh, if we look at um, dynamic similitude, that means the Reynolds number is the same. It's actually kinematic similitude, but we'll uh, go through that. We said that the most important of these numbers was this ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. which is Reynolds number. And you can surmise from what we just said about this little graph that I drew that looks like for a pipe flow Reynolds number versus Euler number. Actually looks like this. This will become clear exactly what I'm talking to you about not today but in, in subsequent weeks. That the other one is the Euler number. The Euler number is the ratio of pressure forces. All of these are forces. We talked last time about being a force per unit volume. Pressure force is the destruction of momentum force on, on the, the truck going behind the plane. And divided by the inertial force. And so, for instance, if we look at flow in a pipe uh, we talked last time that we can have an average velocity of flow it's going to be parabolic in shape but we replace that parabola 
by parabolic shape by just a constant average velocity. We are going to supply along the length of this pipe a pressure gradient from upstream to downstream. Call that dp and we'll call the length of this pipe dx. And we have some characteristics of this pipe, which I'll try and draw here. It has a diameter, which we already said was uppercase D. And the other properties that we would have of this fluid would be it has some kind of density, and it has some kind of viscosity. And so we can describe this behavior of this system, this pipe, if we know what the pressure drop we apply given along given length is, what the diameter of the pipe is, what the fluid is that's flowing in it, and if we apl apply those, we could measure the velocity that the fluid comes out of it by filling a bucket up over a given time. That, that's all we need to do. It turns out, I'm not trying to make things difficult, but we alluded to this last time, the equations that we get, which we've kind of suggested might look like this, would be exact, would, oh, sorry, it's terrible, would be very similar if we're looking at a pipe which is closed. And so the velocity of the fluid going around here does this. And you could define it in terms of the same variables. The, the fluid would have a density and viscosity. The pipe would have some uh, diameter attached to it. And in this particular case, you could imagine that there's a pressure on here, we could call dp, which will result from the impact of the air stagnating against that capped off end. And it would give in the, exactly analogous to the fact that this pipe we actually have to hold in place by applying some, uh, you could imagine, sh some shear force. You could imagine us holding this pipe in place by some shear, I guess I'm going to call it shear force S. This is a shear stress on the boundary. So if, if flow is going through this pipe, it's losing pressure upstream to downstream. To hold that pipe in place, you could actually calculate what that force is that you have to hold it just by taking the upstream pressure, the downstream pressure. All of that has to be lost on the edges of that, interior edges of that pipe. And so if you take the pressure divide multiplied by the area, the downstream pressure multiplied by the area, take, subtract them from each other, that gives you the net force you have to apply. And you could imagine that, perhaps it's more easy to think about it if you had a capped off um, tube, that if it's in a, a wind, like the truck going behind the plane, you'd be applying a similar force. It won't be the same force, but it's the same idea. You could calculate the force to hold that in place. Okay. So our basic idea is this. Um, when we talked about Navier-Stokes equations, I think it was in the one that was in lieu of our um, exam review class, 8.3. So I think it was 8.3, if you want to look for this. We talked about the equation for this. We got it from Navier-Stokes. And the equation is this, that the average velocity is equal to the pipe diameter squared divided by 32 times the viscosity of the fluid uh, and multiplied by the pressure gradient. So if we apply an upstream pressure along a length of pipe, we know what this is. If we have a pipe that's a certain diameter, we know what this is. If we know what the, viscos the fluid is, we know its viscosity. If we know its temperature, so we know the, the, uh, the average velocity. So average velocity just means that when it comes out of here, if you drew the velocity across this section, we're assuming that it looks like this, when in reality it looks a bit like this. Biggest in the middle, zero on the sides, and parabolic. So this is what our V bar is. Okay. So we said that we think that these relationships here are going to be the ones that might uh, control what's going on. So why don't we take this equation, and I'm going to write it again down here so we have it. I'm just going to repeat this. 
And I want to cast it in terms of the Euler number and the Reynolds number. And so the Euler number is this. So rho v squared over p. So how do I get that? I could multiply both sides by v. I could multiply both sides by rho. That's a rho, not a p. It'll confuse me if I don't do it properly. And I can divide both sides through by dp. A change in pressure. So right now, what's this? This, this term here is absolutely 1 over Euler number. Rho v squared over dp is just the reciprocal of this. And what else do I want to do? So I could also multiply this thing by 1. So, okay, so, so I can get rid of this, because those repeat. I can see I have most parts of Reynolds number here. Velocity, density, times a length scale. I don't have a length scale, so let me multiply this by 1 on the right-hand side. dx over dx is just 1, right? So now, if I simplify this, and I am going to note the fact that uh, I can... What do I want to do? So I have d squared. Oh yeah, okay. So I can get rid of this, and I can get rid of this. And so I'm just going to rewrite it. I'm going to write it as 1 over 32 mu. No, sorry, 1 over 32. And I'm going to take gather the other terms. I'm going to take mu from here. I'm going to take one of these d's, v and rho, v, rho, and d. And then I'm left with another d and a dx. And so if I look at what these are, this term here is exactly Reynolds number, where this is the characteristic length that we have. It can be any length of our system. This is just a factor, a constant, and this is the, the length of the pipe to its diameter. And so maybe I can write this out as, um, well, <coughs> 1 over Euler number is equal to 1 over 32 multiplied by V rho D over mu, which is definitely Reynolds number. And length ratio. So I'm just writing this as, as the length of pipe. So what that says is it says something about if we, what it does is it reduces this to a minimum number of variables. So instead of having an equation that had roughly five variables, pressure, dx, diameter, viscosity, density, and that's it, and velocity, six variables, I guess. We have one that includes, which is basically 1 over uh, Euler number, a constant, Reynolds number, and length over diameter. And so if we wanted to, we could do some experiments, and we could plot those experiments instead of like all those variables here, remember if I skip back to this, instead of 10 different graphs, which give us no information whatsoever, I can plot a single plot, and that plot will look something like this one, that's right here. And it's going to be either 1 over Euler number is equal to Reynolds number, and it will look, I think, something like this, where if I plot it as Euler number, just from what I know from this behavior, 
then it looks something like this. And this is about 2000. It's Reynolds number, by the way. This is turbulent. And this is laminar. And you can't tell that from anything we've done today, that this would look like this, but it does. What you can tell from what we've done today is that you can absolutely make a relationship between parameters grouped into an Euler number, parameters grouped into a Reynolds number, and these different variables here would be functions of uh, different lengths over diameter. So, so to, to represent this equation, you really need, and let me just do it schematically, you'd need these two values for Euler number and Reynolds number, and you'd have one curve for length over diameter equals one, length over diameter equals two, etc. So this is what this means. It means that if you have three variables in here, this is a constant, then these three non-dimensional groups are what is controlling the behavior. It may be that these things overprint for a given um, value of this number. We don't know that. In some cases they will. But we know that we need at least we could need at least three numbers to be able to define this behavior. So the other thing that's relevant to this is that um, these charts and this value of Euler number, they do look the same independent of whether we're looking at flow inside a pipe like this, in which case we'll, we'll look at a, pro, a parameter which is called the friction factor. If it's capped off, let's, let's do it like the, foot, the soccer ball. If it's a soccer ball, which air is flowing around, then the parameter that is the Euler number is the coefficient of drag. And if it happens to be an open channel with fluid flowing in it, then it will be called uh, a Manning coefficient after its original originator, Manning coefficient. So in other words, weeks uh, 10 and 11, we'll talk about pipe flow. Week 12, we'll talk about external flows. And week 13, we'll talk about open channel flows. And so the thing that unifies all of these is that these are basically an Euler number that allows us to plot a variable as a function of Reynolds number. Reynolds number, as you remember, indexes the kind of flow. It tells us whether it's, um, so in other words, uh, a laminar flow would look like this with no separation. And turbulent flow would look like this. Bad drawing, I think, right? But you understand this, this vortex tree. So, so that's kind of the big picture. And that's where we're... Whoops, didn't mean to do that. But I'm trying to make it a little larger for you. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So, so understand the big picture. One way to get to understand what this graph looks like, this Euler number versus, it's really a pressure drop that's driving flow versus how fast flow goes, is really what it is. And so the way to do, one way to do that is by dimensional analysis. So I didn't even mention that really the essence of what we'll do today is this idea of Buckingham Pi. But I guess we've made the case that We'd like to be able to figure out exactly how we work out what these non-dimensional parameters are that might allow us to generate this equation. So in this particular case, we already knew what the relationship was 
for flow velocity as a function of pressure drop. And from that, we could show that it conformed to these non-dimensional values of Reynolds number and Euler number. What if we didn't have this equation, that we had no idea what this is? Is there a way that we could draw this figure and figure out exactly what the, the values of this uh, coefficient should be that we should use? And the answer to that is yes. It's called Buckingham Pi theorem, which is what we'll talk about now. And it's a, a formal formalism. There almost certainly will be a, a, a question, well, there will be a, almost certainly a question of this on um, the third exam, not this exam. And uh, it's probably easiest to do an example, but I'll just go through the basic idea. The basic idea is that you take your problem and you define all of the variables that control the flow within your system. So in our particular system, we have an average velocity, we have a density of the fluid and the viscosity. So we'll do exactly the same system for a pipe flow, uh, but using Buckingham Pi theorem, assuming we don't have any equation. We know what the properties of the fluid are. We know what the diameter of the pipe is. We know what the pressure drop is. I'm running out of space here, but the pressure drop would be dp over dl. And in this particular example, which follows exactly what the book is doing, delta PL, as it's classified here, importantly, is equal to not just the change in pressure, but the change in pressure over the length of the pipe. This is the length of the pipe. So this describes our system. These are fluid properties, density and viscosity. We have a velocity, we have a pressure drop. I don't know why this is a B. Does it get used as a B in the rest of it? it must get used as a D, right? Yes. There's another example we did that was a the, the aperture of duct. Make this this is D. Geometry of the pipe and the pressure drop per unit length along the pipe. So what Buckingham Pi says that if we can describe our system with all the variables that are important, in this case five, velocity, density, viscosity, diameter, and pressure drop per length, then if within those five properties we represent all three of our behaviors of mass, length, and time, so in other words, velocity is uh, length over time, so certainly length and time are represented, Density is mass per unit volume, so definitely mass is represented. So all three of those properties are represented in this ensemble group. If you take the total number, number of dimensions and the total number of mass, length, and time that are represented and subtract one from the other, it says that we'll get two groups that describe that. And these groups will be Euler number in, and Reynolds number from what we've just done. We, we, we could expect that that's the case but we don't need to know that first. So what we're going to do, I'm just trying to think the best way to do it. The best way to do it is just to do it, I guess. This is just an explanation. I'm not going to go through the explanation. I'm going to do an example. So here's the pipe flow example done using Buckingham Pipe. We have these five variables. This is rates of change of pressure with length, maybe just L, or if you prefer, delta P over L. Same thing. And the other four variables, two that represent the fluid, one that represents the, the resulting velocity, and one that represents the diameter of the pipe. We can figure out what each of these variables are that represent each of these properties. The easiest one, we know that velocity is length over time. We know that density is mass per unit volume. The more challenging ones, we can look up, but we can also get them. You know, we can write, if you don't know what viscosity is, I guess you could always know that um, yeah. viscosity is equal to, well, Shear stress is equal to viscosity 
times velocity over length, right? Newton's second law. This is equal to force over area. And so if you want to know what viscosity is, then if you multiply both sides by uh, a length and divide by velocity, so I'm just doing this, then that should give us the value of viscosity. And so, get rid of this. So in other words, viscosity is equal to, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So mass times acceleration is meters per second squared. Area is in terms of length squared. Length is in terms of length, and velocity is in terms of length over time. So hopefully this works out. Uh, we'll see if it does. So we have length squared over the top. We have mass. We have t squared, so we get rid of this. And so it should be in units of mass time minus 1 length minus one. Mass, yeah, fine, that's right. So you can always do it. We did this on the second time we met, maybe. So if you don't know what these are, you can always figure them out in some way. And so I know what, that force is equal to mass times acceleration because this is Newton's law. So have some confidence to do this. So dial back. That was a digression. We have five variables to describe the system. These five variables include mass, length, and time. So the total number of pi terms that we have is going to be the number of variables that describe our system minus the number of mass, length, and time represented. If mass, for instance, wasn't represented in here, then this would be 2, and we'd have three variables, pi variables. In this case, we know that we have 2. So the recipe is that we're going to take the variables that describe our system, and there's also this other one, delta PL, and we'll choose what we call repeating variables. And so what we want in these repeating variables is that these repeating variables should represent all of the units of the system. So the three repeating variables that we have should include mass, length, and time. I should mention that there are three repeating variables. So from this list of five, we're going to choose three that represent all, in some way, mass, length, and time. So let's take diameter, velocity, and density, not for any particular reason. They include length, they include time, and they include mass. So we satisfy this requirement. So these are our repeating variables that we'll use for the calculation. If we've taken out these repeating variables, which I will circle, d, rho, and velocity, then what we're left with are two other variables. And we've said already that we have two pi groups. So we'll use these two other remaining variables to figure out what these two pi groups are. And so what we'll do is we'll pick one of these blue circled ones first, and we'll use that. And so in this example, we use this one first. We're going to take this one first, and we're going to take this one second. Okay. So scroll down. Pi, pi 1 term. The three repeating variables, d, diameter, velocity, and density and the other free, free variable that we have. The basic idea is this. You notice that when we talked about these dimensionless numbers, by definition, they have no dimensions attached. To them. And so if you take um, something that is, let's say you take, uh, you want a variable to have dimensions 
of length to the power zero. If you have a parameter which is length to the power one, and if you have a parameter length to the power minus one, then together, when you multiply these together, then the units of this product have to be no units of length, because it's meters and one over meters. If we multiply this by meters cubed and multiplied by meters to the minus two and meters to the minus one, this would still be true. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try and find a mixture of these repeating variables raised to some power so that when we combine them together with these unknown powers that we have, the product of these gives us a parameter which has no units of length, no, no excess dimensions attached to it, no excess units. So it's dimensionless. So it's just a formalism of doing that. So the way to do it is this. We take these repeating variables and the extra parameter. We figure out what the units are of each of them. So this is the easiest one. Well, this is pressure drop. So this is pressure divided by length. So we remind ourselves that this is dp over length, not just pressure. And the units are this. The units of diameter are length to the power a. We don't know what a is. The units of velocity are length over time to the power b. And the units of density are mass per unit volume to the power c. What we want them to do is that the units of this have to be, in aggregate, equal to the power zero, just like it was here. And so what we have is we have three values of a value of a, a value of b, and a value of c. And so if we can write this equation three times, then we can solve the three equations simultaneously and try and figure out what these three unknown a, b's, and c's are. That's what we're going to do. So if you go down in these columns, if we write them first for the units of mass, write one equation for units of mass. Mass to the power 1 is here. Length to the power... Sorry, yeah, mass. In this one, there's no units of mass. So this is 0. For velocity, there's no units of mass. So this is 0. And for density, there's mass to the power c. So this is c. And we know that mass on this side has to equal 0. The next parameter. Let's do it for length. This is length to the power minus 2 in this parameter, this term here. This is length to the power a, this parameter here. This is length to the plus b. And this is length to the minus 3c. And these all have to equal 0, which is this. Okay. Second simultaneous equation. And then the final one is for time. We know that time is to the minus 2 in this one. There's no time here. There's time to the minus 1 times b here, so minus b. And there's no time here. And so we solve it simultaneously. Uh, we know that c has to be equal to minus 1. If we know what c is, then we know that this is equal to minus 1. We know in this case that b uh, plus b is equal to minus 2 without doing anything else. So the first and the third equations are pretty simple in this case. And if we know both c and b, we can put this into here, and this would be minus 2. And if we solve for a, we end up with 1, I think. I won't do it because I'll probably get it wrong. So now, if we go back to this expression and we write this pi 1 term out, we have delta PL to the power 1. We have d to the power 1. 
we have v to the power minus 2, v squared, in the denominator. And we have density to the power c, which is minus 1. So this, what we've done is we've just defined the first pi term by this recipe. And this, of course, is equal to what? Let me, uh, okay. So let me write it out as something we've seen before. This is the same as dp over l d v squared rho, which is the same as being equal to dp v squared rho times d of rho. And I'll use my prerogative of a different color so it sticks out. What's this? This is the Euler number. And this is a dimensionless length, length over diameter. Came in our other equation. Okay? So, let's backtrack a little bit. We said that we have five variables. Three of them repeat, which are these. We have a non-repeating variable. We have two of them. We took the first one, which was pressure drop over length. Now we have a second one to do. So we take the second non-repeating variable, and we come back and we make exactly the, the second pi term. So the second pi term is the repeating variables, which are these, and the non-repeating variable, which was pressure before, pressure over length, and now we've, we've substituted the fifth one instead of the fourth one. We do exactly the same thing. We figure out what the, the properties are, the units are of each of these parameters for viscosity. Of course, these ones, and this is important to remember, especially on a test, because you don't have to repeat this, these will be exactly the same as before. And so these terms here won't be any different from the previous one. Right? This is minus 3c. This is minus 3c. But what will change will be this one, right? Because it's different. If we look at the mass term, this viscosity is mass to the power 1. So this is plus 1 here. If we look at the length equation, viscosity is length to the minus 1, which is this term here. And for the time term, viscosity is time to the minus 1, this term here. So all of these other terms are exactly the same as they were before. They have to be equivalent to the zero exponents of here on the right-hand side. So the only thing that's changed is this. And so we can do the same as before. We can solve this. So now c is going to be equal to minus 1 if we just solve this, the equations simultaneously. Uh, b is going to be easy because b is going to be equal to minus 1 as well. So this equation and this equation give us these first two. And then if we know that b is equal to minus 1, and if we know that c is equal to minus 1, I won't do the math because I'm sure, again, I'll get it wrong. We can figure out what a is, and a is equal to minus 1. We go back to this pi term. We write this equation out by making the substitutions. Uh, let me use a green pen. So. We know that this is to the power 1. We know that d is to the power a, which is equal to minus 1. Let me just do it this way. Let me just write it out here. We know that mu is to the power 1. We know that d is to the power a, which is equal to the minus 1. We know that velocity is to the power b, which is equal to minus 1. And we know that density is to the power c, which is also equal to minus 1. And of course, if we write this in the way that we would do, this would be viscosity on the top. These are all 1 over diameter, velocity, density. 
which is equal to 1 over Reynolds number. So this is just this here. That's it. So this is equal to 1 over Reynolds number. And so what we, uh, if there are more variables, then we go through it. Uh, what you see we, has happened here, which makes it a bit simpler, is that because the term delta PL is equal to dP over L, then this length scale is included in this variable. And so there are only two variables. You remember that when we looked at this equation before, the flow equation, we end up with Euler number being related to Reynolds number, but through a length diameter term. This length diameter term doesn't turn up in what we've just done because the length term was included in the pressure. And so uh, it kind of falls out in that the first pi term we have isn't just pure Euler number, but it was Euler number multiplied by this. So it's exactly the same. And so that's the formalism that is called Buckingham Pi, and it allows us to get a final relationship. And it basically allows us to say that uh, in this particular relationship, this is equal to Euler number times D over L, which is equal to this, is equal to Reynolds number. And so this allows us exactly to be able to do some experiments, a minimum set of experiments, which would allow us to say, measure the variables, these five variables that we have in our system, and create, do one at a particular Reynolds number, in which case we measure a pressure drop, and we get a point. We do one at a different Reynolds number, we get a different point. We do one at a different velocity, we end up with a different point. And so dimensional analysis is just a way of being able to do experiments where instead of randomly doing as many experiments with all the variables changing in unison and getting very complex results, is it allows you to figure out the minimum number of variables that describe our particular system. And in our particular case for pipe flow, it's an Euler number which is actually, we'll call it a friction factor. And we'll give it the term squiggly F, a length to diameter ratio, and a Reynolds number. And we'll end up with these curves that I've kind of already alluded to. You'll get sick of these curves that look like this, with equations where it's laminar. and also turbulent. So the beauty of what's been done here is you don't need to have any equations to describe what's going on. You need to be able to do some experiments. You need to be able to figure out what the important groups of variables and how they, they group together. And, uh, and then plot your results using those groups and you get a compact form. So it's no different from those of you who are petroleum engineering or in environmental systems engineering, if you look at type curves for well, well testing, the dimensionless parameters which are usually on the axes for those can be derived in exactly the same way as using Buckingham Pi. So Buckingham Pi is just a recipe. Um, there will almost certainly be one you're not thinking about now, but on exam three, you're always given the dependent variables uh, and then you choose work through the other three variables because if you don't get given what the dependent variables are, or the repeating variables rather, then you get different <coughs> results, which can always be manipulated into the same form, a single form, but to allow grading, uh, you're always given the dependent variables. Not on your mind today, I'm sure. So. Buckingham Pi, very, very, very useful. Uh, we didn't get to go through some examples, but probably we spent more time describing the method than usually we do, and that's important. It's a recipe. So it's very easy to do. If you're given these variables, if you're told which ones are repeating one, you can work your way through it. I guess the interesting thing is to what to do with it once you have it. And what you do with it once you have it is to try running a, taking some measurements on a model. And if you can, for instance, run your model at the same Reynolds number 
that your prototype will be run at, then by definition, if they're both run at the same Reynolds number, they will have the same Euler number. And the Euler number is a pressure applied on something. So you could think about it being the pressure that hits the truck in the side, or it could be the pressure that's applied on the bottom of a plane as the lift underneath the, the airfoils. So it allows you to be able to make that transformation.